Hello, everybody, and welcome to Vinely. This is a Psalm Table show, and here we basically hang out with some of the world's best winemakers and sommeliers, wine experts, and aficionados uh, in the industry. So I'm really, really proud today to invite two fabulous guests. We have a master sommelier, which is Michael Jordan. Michael, say hello. <laughs> How you doing there, Mike? Uh, Mike, you also make some great shoes. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, thank you very much for making the best shoes in the world. Uh, <laughs> we got Fred. We got Fred. You, you must have heard that joke a few million times, huh, Michael? Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Fred, we've got also uh, Fred Shearer, which is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal, really uh, one of the best winemakers that I know for, for sure, specializing in Pinot Noir in the Russian Valley in Napa. So I want to really welcome you both. Fred, uh, Fred how are you doing today? Doing great. Awesome. Now, I've heard about you guys for a long time. You guys are the perfect pair when it comes to uh, music. I really, I really like the way you guys sound together. And I thought, man, would it be amazing to have you both play on our show today? Uh, I've heard about great uh, pairing in food. I've, he I've heard, you know, great pairing in, in, in spirits and, and uh, popcorn, if you will, whatever. Is, but this is just unique, the fact that we can talk about so many different things so many things that are perhaps not related to the technicality of wine, because we talk about wine varietals and wine notes, and uh, boy, I just want to talk about what inspires you, what what is your passion, and what you bring to music. So as you know, we have a lot going on here today uh, in terms of what's going on in our planet, in our world, in our country, in our families, everywhere around us. And I don't want to talk about you know what. I really don't want anybody to talk about it because I'm just sick and tired of it. But I want to perhaps see if in you, instead of using words, how about you guys just maybe play something that means something to you that is right on cue and what's happening today. Fred, I think you should kick it off. Oh, I'd be happy to. Yeah, you know, uh, just we're uh, prevented from doing a lot of things that we normally do. Like Michael and I love to play together. And when we're right next to each other, we are, our hearts are like in unison and everything. And we can't do that now. And uh, but we're we're finding ways around it. So. This is, uh, I, I like to play different stuff, and this is one that I think really kind of kind of gets at. You guys can sing along out there if you want. I saw her today at the reception Glass of wine in her hand She was going to meet her connection At her feet was a footloose man You can't always get what you want Can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want Try sometimes, you might find you get what you need Went down to the demonstration Get my fair share of abuse Saying don't bend some of this frustration Gonna blow a 50 amp fuse And that's pretty big, you know Cause you can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want Try sometimes, you might find You get what you need I'm feeling it too, man. I went down to the Chelsea drugstore Get your prescription filled Was standing in line with Mr. Jimmy Man, did he look pretty ill No, he's wearing a mask I decided that we would get a soda My favorite flavor, 
cherry red I sang my song to Mr. Jimmy Said one word to me and that was dead I said to him You can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want You can't always get what you want But if you try sometimes you might find You get what you need all right very very beautiful song that really exemplifies what's going on today we um can't get that perfect world back maybe but uh at least we can live with what we have very beautiful song thank you so much thank you so much and then i mike i know you got something burning in you i i know you want <laughs> we gotta hear those uh those those fingers play that beautiful song that i heard come on mike all right, thanks, Bertie. I uh, I would like to play stuff that is a little bit whimsical at times too. And Fred and I play a lot of uh, we segue in and out of different songs. And this one uh, it was written by John Prine, our good friend that has passed on. So we want to send great we want to send great waves on up to him. And uh, it's called it's an old school man. Grandpa was a carpenter. Grandpa wore his suit to dinner nearly every day for no particular reason. He just dressed that way. Brown necktie on his matching vest, both his wingtip shoes, built a blunt closet on our back porch put can in a burned out grandpa was a carpenter he built houses stores and banks he chain smoked camel cigarettes and hammered nails and planks he was a level on the level he shaved even every day pulling for eyes and teacher. She went to school at Bowling Green. She traded in her milking cow for a singer sewing machine. Well, she called her husband Mr. And she walked real tall and fried. She used to buy me comic books after Grandpa died. Grandpa was a carpenter. He built houses, stores, and banks. He was a metal on a level, he shaved him in every door. Well, if rising Howard, cause Lincoln won the war. Well, if rising Howard, cause Lincoln won the war. Awesome. Woo! <laughs> nice. I love that song. I remember the first time you put that to me, man. I love it. Find it something, man. So all you folks listening, you're probably wondering, well, where's the wine glasses? Why are you talking about why you're playing music? You're not hey. talking about wine. Hey, we got plenty of wine. Don't worry. We'll make more. <laughs> buy it buy it up. Let we're talking you. about what what we love to do when we're not working on wine is Fred and I love playing music together. Hey, this is it right here, though. I have to tell you guys. This <laughs> this Pinot Noir right here, 2015, by Fred Shearer. Uh, this is really phenomenal. I have to tell you. One of the things that I, I noticed about it was this smokiness. Uh, I know there were fires up there in that area in 2008, and I heard a lot of people say, "Hey, it's going to destroy uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of vintages." And uh, I don't think so, Fred. What, what? How did you make such an incredible wine on on, on the heels of that? Well, there, you know, the 2008 was a year that there were some fires, and it affected some vineyards in certain places. And this is the first time I ever encountered that, and um, it. I just didn't quite know what to do. You know, it wasn't in the rule book. We were all figuring that out. And so I um, researched it a little bit and uh, did what I thought was right, which is the opposite of what some of the experts were telling us we should do. 
And um, it, what I ended up doing, it worked. It, uh, I left it in barrel longer and I had more new barrels in there and it turned out that the, the new wood actually um, absorbed some of those smoke molecules and stuff and it just took it out. And there's some other high tech stuff you can do that uh, separates it out, kind of breaks you know things apart, breaks down on the wine into different pieces and then you mess with it and put it back together. But there's a rebound effect and then it would kind of come back. So there's just different ways to go about it. And, and me, I like the old school, you know, peasant logic kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I'll think about it scientifically, too. But uh, anyway, so we've had a, a couple of uh, other situations like that and uh, you know, it kind of works out. You know, I also tried the Zinfandel and I have to tell you, I had the same effect, even though, uh, you know, a little less perhaps. Uh, on the nose, but I have to tell you that also an incredible output. I mean, you, you waited a, a little bit of time to get these out at the right time, it seems like, right? Yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, if you walk slower, it takes longer to get there, but uh, you enjoy the ride longer, and that's kind of how we do our winemaking. Uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I got a question for you, Mike. I mean, how would you pair uh, something like this wonderful Pinot, and what would you do with this beautiful wine? Uh, how do you how do you pair this, aside from the music? Well, Fred, Fred's Pinot Noir is uh, one of my favorites, you know, and, and that's that's how we became friends. Certainly, I, I bought a lot of it from my restaurants over the years. I've served it to many of my guests and paired some great meals with it and had chefs design food for these wines as well. Uh, and what, one of the things that I love about the way Fred makes his wine, he and his wife, Judy, actually will be testing the blends that he's making before he bottles the wine. He takes a bottle home, and if they're not fighting over the last sip with their dinner, he's going to go adjust the blend a little bit and <laughs> change it up until that wine is dialed in. So with, with Pinot Noir from Russian River Valley, especially the cold sites that Fred has access to, with all of this the spice and, and beautiful natural acidity that, that the grape gives to these wines in these cold nights. Uh, I think, you know, you, you could certainly go anything with feathers, okay? And as well, uh, pigs and pinot, they have a mad love affair with each other too. So, you know, a, a, just a grilled pork chop uh, with not a lot of fancy stuff on it and let this beautiful fruit, the cherry and berry, that's in that wine be the condiment that you would have with that beautiful, juicy, the other white meat, you know? So I think, you know, chicken, pheasant, quail, squab, or pork. And the other thing that I really love with this is Asian barbecue spare ribs. Something about that kind of hoisin barbecue sauce sets off the fruit in, in that Pinot Noir that he makes. Now with the Zinfandel, man, oh man, I, I love his old, and and uh, old vine and and uh, well, he, tell tell us the exact name of that wine, Fred. Old and mature vines, because the old vines my grandfather planted in 1912, when he was 21 years old, and then the mature vines we planted <laughs> in the 70s and early 80s. Yeah. So uh, my first couple of vintages, I was only from the old vineyard from 1912, and then I started using some of the younger vines, and uh, I couldn't call it old vine anymore. You know, because at that time, those wines were only about 20 years old or so. Only only 20. Yeah. So um, I called it Old Amateur Wines. And people laughed at me at first, but I'm used to people laughing at me. So, you know, it's no big deal. And uh, so that's that's been our trademark wine for, you know, decades. And they, they yeah. really complement each other well. Our old wines are actually have more. It's kind of like people. They don't work as fast or as hard looking, but they're smart. There's more wisdom there. And there's these layers and nuances and perfumes in the old vineyard. Whereas the mature vines have a little bit more strength to them and muscle. It's real interesting. I don't work with any other old vineyards. Uh, so I, I, don't, I didn't understand why our old vines seem to be so you know, delicate and nuanced. But I, then it hit me. We have hardly any non-Zinfandel vines out there. It's almost 100% Zinfandel. You know, and so many of the old Zinfandel vineyards have uh, you know, beefier varieties in there. You know, Carignan, some Grenache and Petit Syrah and stuff like that. And we have very little of that other stuff in there. And I think that's probably one of the reasons because it doesn't take very much of those beefy, you know, more tannic sort of things to uh, really uh, color and affect the, the Zinfandel and in, in a positive way. You know, it's just a reflection of the site and, uh, and the, the kind of vines that are going in. 
Birdie and Fred, that was my inspiration to play that song, Grandpa Was a Carpenter, because Fred's grandfather planted those vines back in 1912. Amen to him, I tell you. And again, if you guys want to taste this wonderful wine, I'm sorry i got to make this plug. It's uh, SherRWinery.com. That's spelled S-C-H-E-R-R-E-R, winery.com. I just had to, I had to do it. So, <laughs> so you guys, I, I have a question. I don't know how you guys met, but I know you, you've been playing together for a while. Uh, the, the songs are incredible. Could you tell me a little bit about, you know, just briefly, uh, like there's a couple of songs that I heard you guys play really well back to back. And could you maybe, uh, Michael, could you like set us up with that? Or maybe if you want Fred, you can do it. Those two songs that I, I completely fell in love with. <laughs> well, let me answer. Let me answer how I met Fred first. I was working in my restaurant Napa Rose at the Disneyland Resort, which we had opened to bring wine country to Southern California, and uh, it, it was you know, it was just a spectacular experience, and and uh, it, it was a great restaurant at its time. And so Fred and his family, his, his wife and uh, sister's family were there e eating dinner. And as I walked up to the table, because I was the general manager in the sommelier and ran the place, uh, his sister, who really wanted to put in a plug for Fred, said, hey, he makes wine. Well, I, I'm the wine geek of all time, so I heard that. I, well, really? Where? And so he says, Russian River Valley. Well, that's one of my favorite places in the entire world. I love it. And for many reasons, we don't have enough time to talk about right now. But I said, really? Well, it piqued my interest. And uh, she said, yeah, he makes really good Pinot Noir. Well, he already had me at, at Russian River Valley, so I want to try. We tasted the wines that night, of course, because she brought a bottle down from the room. And then I said, man. Uh, we well, we found out that we both like to play guitar. I always have a couple guitars and maybe an acoustic bass, you know, down in my office. We went down there, we jammed guitars on the first day we ever met, and uh, we've been best friends ever since. It's just a, uh, and I've been I've served Fred's wines in every one of my restaurants since then. It's They're a, great wines. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Uh, and. Uh, but you guys started playing not only that it wasn't just at one time you just kept playing and i think it got better and better uh i think it was what was that song uh, about the devil that you that you guys were playing uh the friend friends friend mother. of the devil can you play yeah. that one that that, that one's yeah let's play that friend oh, okay we're on. gonna play that. it's amazing all right friend of the devil grateful dead actually right. it's great grateful fred <laughs> and and the grateful living okay sorry so true. Here we go. All right. All right. Let her rip, man.
song such it's a great, great couple of songs we got bob marley and the grateful dead together wow we're doing some great pairing here you guys um i wanted to ask you a couple questions i'm sure a lot of people also watching the show want to know you know uh i'll start with you mike these are questions that i've been itching to ask and you know you're one of the very very few people um who have uh, become a master so many not an easy feat because um, it must take years. And it, it, not only that, it must take an incredible dedication to be a master sommelier. I, I think there's 200 master sommeliers around the world or something like that. Uh, something crazy. But what got you to go down this road? How, what really drove you to become that committed? And you know, could you tell us a little bit about how that was and how it happened? Well, <laughs> I... Wow. I've uh, been a restaurant man all my life. I grew up in the restaurant business in my dad's restaurant from the time I was 11 years old. And, you know, what do you do with an 11 year old kid every day after school? You, if you have a restaurant, you make them mop the floor and wash the pots and pans. So that's how I started. And I remember when I was 13, I called my dad, 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 come here. I want to show you something. You know, what? What? 
hey, I can reach the rack where the glasses go at the dishwasher <laughs> finally because I'm tall enough. And so he goes, well, you're going to get a promotion to dishwasher. So I'll never forget, man. <laughs> My first promotion to dishwasher. I was 13. It was the best thing. And I continued in the kitchen because I loved cooking. And I, I did every job in the kitchen up until the, the chef of my dad's restaurant passed away. I was the first cook. I became the chef. And then I ended up doing every job in the restaurant, every single job. Uh, bus boy, back waiter, front waiter, manager, uh, even parking attendant and, you know, bartender, you name it, did them all. And so 40 years, 45 years actually of, of restaurant work and um, when I after I had been in the business, oh man, over 35 years, and I was working at Disneyland Resort, and I was running that uh, Napa Rose restaurant, I met Master Sommelier Fred Dame, and I learned of the court of Master Sommeliers, and I said, there is a diploma for this? <laughs> I gotta get that, man. I've been doing this all my life, and I, the, I caught the the bug, I was addicted to it. I studied every day. I had seven boxes of flashcards and learning how to do the blind tasting and wine and all that stuff. It took, after 35 years of being in business and being a pro like that, it took seven years still to, to pass that darn thing. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. So thanks for asking. Uh, I, I'm pretty grateful that I got introduced to it. It's the, you know. It's pretty amazing that you, you know, the, the, it's not an easy thing to do, right? I mean, this is something that comes with a lot of work and, and, uh, and uh, you pair a lot of food, but you also do a lot of things around the wine world. You're very well known. You travel all over the world and, uh, you know, you work for some pretty big companies. Um, but, you know, you've, you've always been known as uh, the so many of the people, the sum of the people. Really, I've heard that for so long, but really, I think you're the one who actually coined that, or at least you should be. So what, you know, how do you democratize uh, uh, being a song? Because look, a lot of people get a little bit deterred when they hear, oh, you're a so many, or you're a wine expert, or gosh, I love wine, but I really don't know the first thing about it, and shit, a lot of things about it I wish I knew. How do you make it approachable, Mike? How do you make it all so cool? I mean... Well, thank you for asking that. That, I think, is where I really found my niche with all of this. And like you said, well, yeah, there have been more people that have been into space than have become master sommeliers. It's true. The, the exam is freakishly hard. I don't know why it should be so hard because we're not doctors you know, or anything. But I, I have been always been known as the sommelier for the people because I like to demystify the whole wine thing and make it easy for our guests to enjoy wine. And then, you know, like first find a wine. We, you know, you don't want to have to do scientific research to, to find a bottle of wine on a wine list. And then you want to find something that's delicious that's not going to break the bank because anybody can spend a hundred bucks on a bottle of wine if they got a hundred dollars. But let's find one for a lot less that's going to be delicious. That's where the sommelier earns his money. The thing that you brought up that I want to say before we end this uh, is that I, I've always, since I've been involved with the court and with teaching and training sommeliers coming up, has been a real kind of a stickler to, to really share with them there's no room for arrogance in this industry. We are servants of the people, a server, a wine, a master sommelier is still just a wine server. Okay, we don't even make the wine. We just pour the wine. We're serving our guests. We're right. creating, uh, we're creating experiences and memories for our guests every day, and that's really the best thing that we get to do. And so, remaining some humility and not being arrogant or egotistical, no matter how many diplomas and all that stuff you get, remember that you know, keep your feet on the ground, and you know, a master sommelier title and two bucks still can't get you a cup of coffee. Okay. <laughs> So you can't take yourself too seriously. Now, it's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. And I got that second diploma, the CWE. There's only 15 people in the world that has those two diplomas. But I'm still the simulator for the people because, the, you know, I, I want them to be able to take my phone call when I call them. Yeah. And people that are so arrogant in the industry forget that you, you, we need all the people. You're, you're not the rock star. You just pour the wine. 
Wine's always been for the people. I mean, you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not something that could um, really separate one group from another. I mean, it's really it, it's such a wonderful living enzyme that goes into your body and makes you feel whatever the winemaker and the weather makes you want to feel at that time. It's something living and. Uh, oh, I, I think you're right. I think everybody needs to have that feeling. I mean, it's much better than a lot of things we have out there, uh, which uh, aren't good for you. Wine is actually pretty damn good for you. And, you know, I think, Fred, uh, you come from a wine family. I mean, you know, you've been sort of like in the trenches all your life. You've seen, you know, uh, that area, Napa, Sonoma, Russian River, more than anybody else. What What is your, I have a kind of a weird question. What is your experience in terms of you know, what is that one position in the whole winemaking process from marketer to, to wine grower? What is that one job that you feel is the most important one? Is it the farmer or is it the, uh, the, the enologist? Uh, what do you feel to you as that key person that really makes it happen? Well, I think um, there isn't one key person in it because it takes a lot of people to make it happen. And if any one of those things didn't happen, the whole thing would stop. So there are a lot of keys gotcha. to the whole thing. And mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of to echo back to what Michael's talking about, the, the idea of, you know, uh, uh, what impresses me about uh, Master Psalms is that they've gone through these incredible, they, they've proven that they know a whole lot of stuff and they're able to blind taste something. And even if they can't tell you exactly what that wine is and nail it all, they can get really close. And if they're wrong, they're wrong for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and about making matches and stuff like that. The service industry and, and that, that uh, the title is just, uh, it validates their skill. And uh, winemakers don't quite have the same, you can go get a degree at a university like I did, and that doesn't mean much of anything. You know, I've, I've heard of people who uh, did really well at school and then they made horrible wines because they, <laughs> you know, they had the technical stuff and, and they, they did well on tests and stuff like that, but, you know, it's like the, the, they they don't know how to cook, right? Right. Right. right? Being book smart is one thing, but yeah. then having the the natural innate sense of taste, flavor, that's balance, uh, it, it, that's more of a humanistic gift yeah. that people tend to overlook. Uh, and and everybody doesn't have it, although you can certainly work on it. But you, anybody can become book smart if you study the book. Yeah. But not everybody can taste uh, this beautiful pink elixir uh, that is just grape juice before it's been fermented and realize what it's going to need to become a delicious wine like Fred can. And not only that, I mean, like we talked about timing, you know, you, wine is really racing to become vinegar. And, and, you know, a good winemaker knows exactly when to reach it before it drops. And that's what these wines will last uh, in the bottle for many, many years. I have to say this is a, definitely a collectible, but I, I, I think that's also a secret, right, Michael? I, I think that you have to catch it right before it um, starts going down. But anyway, I, I, uh, I also want to ask, you know, with, with everything going on, the, you know what, how is that going to change the harvest next season? How is it going to change the way we do business? That's actually a question for both of you. How, how are we going to be doing business in the hospitality world now? What, what do you guys think? Fred, go ahead and tell them about what you're doing in the vineyard. I think it's pretty much the same, no? Production-wise, it's pretty much the same. You know, uh, people are not encouraged to carpool anymore. You know, typically we see more and more of the vineyard crews. um, It's vineyard management companies, and they have a a large crew. And then they show up at a site, and they do the stuff. In the old days, it used to be the family. You know, you'd have a bunch of kids, and you all be out there, like the 11-year-old Michael, you know, if he was in my family, he would have been like the 11 year old Fred out there picking up rocks and, you know, training vines and just doing the stuff because you had you, that that was your crew. But nowadays uh, we've got professionals that do this stuff, these crews that come out and they're so they're kind of discouraged to carpool. But most of them are family anyway. They're in their little circles. So then they come out to the vineyard and do their stuff. Uh, there's sort of natural social distancing in a vineyard anyway, because the vines aren't all right on top of each other. You can get on a separate row and you're already kind of away from people and, you know, you're not sharing tools so much and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, there's there's some of that already going on. Uh, agriculture, which is what winemaking and viticulture are, are about, uh, they're considered 
um, essential industries. So we were never shut down, although the hospitality side of things was, because that's where you have more intimate contact and you have people circulating that are able to infect each other. So uh, from a production standpoint, when, you know, at, at our facility here at the winery, it's uh, my whole payroll is a thousand hours of, of labor here of helping me make this stuff. And that's due during harvest time where we're sorting grapes and punching down and things like that. Uh, the rest of the time, there's really no one else here, right? My wife, Judy, works, you know, she does all of the business sustaining things. And then I do the production kind of stuff. Uh, this year, we've had my son here helping us. He's uh, 21 years old. And I'll tell you what, when you got a 21 year old in the house, you go through more wine in the house, too. <laughs> I've learned that. Um, so we're bringing more bottles home to, to test stuff out. But um, things haven't really changed that much. You know, we're busy as heck. And uh, I've actually started doing stuff. Uh, I have a lot of friends in the hospitality industry and that are, you know, basically locked in their house and they're going a little stir crazy. So I've been, um, you know, doing Zoom meetings and Instagram stuff with them, you know, with their group or, uh, you know, the, the kids in a restaurant in a particular restaurant someplace that will we'll make a meeting, you know, and I'll go, I'll walk around the vineyard and kind of show them what we're doing. Is you it, know, it's no big deal, right? Is the wine tasting room open? Oops. At the winery, or do you do wine tasting still? No. No, we we quit, quit doing all that stuff. And uh, people who have uh, pre-ordered wines from us, we have a, a pickup uh, procedure now, which is basically when you, you tell us about when you're going to come to the winery, we have your wine pulled. When you get to the parking lot, you call us. We grab it, we bring it out with the mask and all that stuff, and, and put it in your trunk or in the back of the car, and uh, you know, off, off you go. And uh, it, it seems to be working. You know when. But we we have to adapt. We have to adapt a whole lot of things. I'm doing a hell of a lot less travel than I used to. I used to go out to different states and stuff and do wine dinners and you know visit wine shops and stuff. And yeah, it's like I'm not that pretty. I don't know why I have to go out there to sell the wine, but they want to talk to somebody. <laughs> Good <a> guitar. No. <laughs> so yeah, I do bring the guitar, but, uh, <laughs> and that's fun. But um, you know, I have a lot more time at home now, and I'm spending a lot more time at the vineyard. You know, my family's vineyard is run by my father, who's 93 years old, and my sister. And uh, he's still out there doing it, you know, but uh, he's he's starting to run out of steam. You know, his, his, body, his strength is really changing, and he's, you know, starting to get used to the fact that he's not 35 years old anymore. But uh, So I'm spending more time out there doing stuff that he will allow me to do. Uh, the dude still drives a tractor, though. And uh, people go, Ed, you haven't been driving on the road for years. You know, you gave up your driver's license. Why are you driving a tractor? He says, well, the vines don't move. Oh, that's true. <laughs> you know? I, I have a picture of him. I'm going to see if I can put it here. Uh, this is him. You, you can't see it on your, your side, guys. But uh, I, I have a picture here that I'm showing the audience uh, and, and together with your mom. So uh, amazing, uh, amazing couple. Uh, that um, yeah, they're playing. So Fred, Fred's, Fred's yeah. dad... Fred's dad is finally allowing him to do some work in the vineyard that Fred never really could do for his dad in that family vineyard that they have. But I want to let you all know wanna, that that's really just one of the areas that Fred gets fruit from for making all of his myriad of wines because this guy's making Cabernet Sauvignon from the family vineyard, but he's got Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Grenache and Syrah and Rosé and amazing Chardonnay and like a, a, a wide... A spectrum of small batch handcrafted artisan wines and I wanted to also say that you know great great farming creates great wines so it's really the farming it is the grape growing that has to happen every year in order to make delicious wines mm -hmm. now you, once you have the great fruit, you could screw it up but Fred doesn't tend to do that and so good good fortune for him but uh, the 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 growing of the grapes, the harvesting and the making of the wine are things that really aren't changing in this this weird time that we have. What's really changed is the way that we're going to market with the wines. Like Fred said, you know, the restaurants had been closed and uh, wine lists are just not not happening. So people like us are all buying our wine online and having it delivered or ordering it from a shop or a winery and then driving by and they throw it in the window as you pass by. <laughs> and But thank God we have that because we can sustain ourselves as long as we've got delicious stuff. We're pretty grateful that we have a great opportunity to enjoy good meals and good food and wine and, and, and beverages while we've been stuck. Uh, and 
thereby now having these virtual experiences becoming extremely popular. And I think it's if there is any kind of silver lining uh, from, from us in our industry, it's that we've discovered this method of being able to reach out to people and bringing people together. And even restaurateurs that used to be highly competitive against each other are finding they really need each other right now. Like it used to be when my parents were running their restaurant and they needed each other to kind of pull together and get through. We're, we're creating that, that, uh, that community, that sense of community in the industry that I hope that will continue on now. So true. I mean, if anything, this, uh, you know what, has become the great equalizer. I mean, we're all standing shoulder to shoulder in every single industry. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity when we come out of this to actually pull through and, and really discover some new things, new talents, and maybe even a new life. Who knows? Uh, but it's so true. There's been a lot of good that, that unfortunately has had, there's a lot of bad, but uh, a lot of good as well uh, is, is to come out of it. So I wanted to ask you guys, because I, I miss hearing yes play again. Um, if I were to say, you know, choose one word. I'm going to start with you, Mike. Choose one word to describe everything that's going on today. Be it what wine means to you, or one word to say what what all this is. You know, what's happened in the last couple of months is, you know, what's happening in one word. Uh, what would what would that word one word be, and why is it that you're using that one word? And then, of course, Fred, I'm going to ask you the same. Well, I want to say that I don't really want to select a word that represents the words like madness, confusion, and uh, fear that, that, that the world has been going through. I would rather use the word that's been my mantra before this ever happened, during, and then long after it's gone, because my word has always been and will be delicious. Ah, nice. Good word. Under, I think I think uh, I have not heard that by anybody. Uh, it's a good word. That's definitely a good word to describe everything. And then Fred, what about you? What would you say? I, maybe you're going to put it into a song. <laughs> I, I can do that. Uh, and I also I think connection is uh, a pivotal word uh, for what we're experiencing because we crave it. We're finding to obtain it wine allows for connection uh, over the years I've just been so uh, honored that people contact us and say you know we had a bottle of your blah 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 wine to celebrate our anniversary and it was so good you know, they had this meal and they, they have these memories it's about connection and, you know we would have never been a part of that had we not made this bottle of wine that somehow got into their hands that had this quality of deliciousness, right? And it, it, it became part of their memories. So I, I think connection is, you know, it just, it's a multifaceted uh, um, connection to the word. <laughs> That's a See, I love that because uh, I always believe that when you share your wine with others, it makes it more delicious. So, those two words work very nicely together. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Bertie, for having us on the show. I'm grateful to you for, you know, hosting us here. And I look forward to getting back with you and doing it again. I can't wait. Yeah. You guys live. You guys want to play something before we go? And Yeah. I want to say thank you to everybody that stopped in today. This show will be um, posted on our website. And, of course, uh, we have this uh, Vinely show, which is part of Psalm Table, every Thursday at 5 o'clock. Um, and let me tell you, the most incredible people are going to come by this. And uh, I'm so honored to have had Fred Shearer, an incredible winemaker, Michael Jordan, not the basketball player, but the great master so many, here with us today. And I want to say thank you and play it on you guys. All the best. So this is a song Michael taught me, and I just absolutely love it. No, he, nobody plays like him, but I play along with him. So they get it from the top, Michael.
Thank you very much, you guys. That was incredible, spectacular, and absolutely delicious. Have a good night. We'll see you next time. Adios. I'll do it again sometime. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. See ya.